Let's go ahead and get started. This is Research Tools ESCI 895-3. I'm your instructor, Kurt Schwer. I'm wearing lots of little weird recording devices because I'm trying to record this for folks who aren't here. We have at least two people at C right now, of course, and we also have at least two people outside of CECOM following along from ships and other places. So I'm going to be trying to record these lectures and post them. I encourage you all, if you want, bring your own recording device, either just audio or audio and video. We have a number of students in here who English is not their first language, and I encourage you all to record. Oh, we have one recording right there, which is great. Record the class by all means and use it however you feel like in terms of learning education. This, this class is open, so if you use the notes for something else, that's fantastic. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing in here, but first, most of you are in front of computers. I asked during this class, please don't go off and do other stuff on the computer that's not related to the class. The computer is there for the class. If you want to take notes on the computer, that's great. If you find you doing fantasy baseball, I'm going to be very upset. By all means, use the computers for note taking and for class. I'm going to talk a little bit about the goals of what we're trying to do in the class, who I am, because who I am is going to influence what material I'm going to show you today. So if you had a different instructor up here, you definitely see a different set, maybe some overlap, maybe not, of material. So you need to know who I am and how to judge what I'm teaching you. And then we'll talk about some of the material that we're going to cover during the course. And if we have time, we're going to look at the CECOM wiki and uh, some of the tools that go into what we'll do in the course. So this is, today's an overview. Don't feel like if you don't understand what's going on, it's just to get you familiar with terms, to know who I am and what's about to happen. Don't expect to actually you know, come out of this class today being able to do something new and fancy and wild. That'll be uh, upcoming classes will give you those tools that we'll be building on. So let me first talk about the goal of the course. I'm going to try and stay away from PowerPoint, not to go too fast. Stop me if I'm going too fast. If I use words that I haven't explained that you don't understand, there is going to be a fair bit of techno babble during this talk. And Rather than keep it in that, you know, what's going on, ask words. As we come along the course, I'm going to try and set up a group chat so you can ask each other. If you don't want to interrupt me, you can ask each other. If you're feeling unsure of how to ask a question, you can discuss it in the group chat while we're going on. I've done that in other places, and it's worked pretty well, so we'll see how that'll go here. But the goal is basically you guys are scientists, and you have computers. Those computers often dictate how you work, and make you work in ways that you don't want to. So we want to turn those, those what are supposed to be tools in front of you into something that's working for you as opposed to you being stuck trying to survive this thing in front of you. I'm going to do a little bit here and there talking about things that aren't computers because paper and pen is a research tool, your brain's a research tool, the person next to you is a research tool, but we're going to focus heavily on the computers. We're going to try and uh, build up a community of people working together to attack these goals. So what are we trying to do? Generally, as a scientist, you want to collect data. And you want to do something with that data. So you want to process it. And from that processed data, you're going to want to save it so that you can use it later on. Other people can use it. So we call that archiving. You're going to want to make sure I got all the things I want here. You're going to write reports. And this one, if you're taking the summer hydro course in the beginning of the summer session, you're going to be building a report for summer hydro where you go out with a ship. And this is going to be one of your key deliverables. You're going to also make charts and maps used for all sorts of different things. In your report, you'll have some key charts and maps. And from that, you and maybe other people are going to write papers which hopefully go off into journals. And based on what you come out of this, you're going to go back and plan to do some more cruises. So if you're at NOAA, you go out and do your next hydrographic survey if you're at one of the other hydrographic organizations. If you're a scientist, you're going to go back and look at the data, have more questions, maybe want to go look at a different part of the world. So you're going to plan. And from there, you're going to mobilize another cruise which we call mob or mobilize. And you're going to go collect more data. And this is a basic flow here in which you have scientific and practical 
applications that you're trying to solve. In the case of practical, one example is mariners. You have people out there driving ships based on data that you've collected, gone through some process, and they're out there driving around a thousand foot natural gas carrier based on stuff that we as a community do. That's a pretty big deal. We're talking about data here and a flow. A part of this is you guys. We have people in here who are driving this process around. And we're trying to give you guys the tools to do this, but we're also trying to get you to collaborate so that you work together down the rest of your career. You're gonna be in this world, whether it be uh, hydro hydrography or general marine sciences or maybe even not marine sciences. Our hope here in this course is that you start working together, you create working relationships with people that will go on past this class. So many of you are gonna go back to other countries afterwards or you're gonna be out at sea. And you need to work with the community as a whole to build up those tools because I may have an iPad and a laptop and a desktop, but I also have the people that I met last year, the year before, who may be somewhere else in the world in a different time zone who I can call on as my tool and say, hey, help, I've got this problem. I know you saw something mm -hmm. like it. Can you please work with me? Those relationships will make or break uh, your career a lot of times. And if you've got them, uh, you may be able to ask someone in the Indian Ocean when you're in the Atlantic Ocean, hey, how'd you fix the whatever on your ship? You get an answer and boom, off you go. If you think about ships, when you're going through all this, we're talking about in US dollars, 50K up to you know $200,000 for one day of ship time out there. And if you're fighting tools and fiddling around with things that aren't working for you, that's wasted time that we can be mapping the ocean. We have a huge world out there, oceans, lakes, rivers, that need mapping, and a lot of it needs mapping again and again as the seafloor changes. So we want to create this optimized path that makes people work as effectively as they can and have a good time doing it to go out there and spend your, t your life out there mapping the world and doing some really great science. So my hope is in this course, I'm gonna show you a whole lot of tools that will help you through this process. I don't expect you to use all of the tools in your career, but I've succeeded if I've influenced you in ways that you like uh, once you leave here to do better science and to have the computer actually help you out more than it's been doing in the past. So I'm gonna go ahead and erase this, walk through some of the tools after I talk about myself. But So knowing who I am really is important in terms of understanding what I'm showing you. Each person's background will influence what they've done. There's thousands and thousands of tools out there and you don't have time to learn them all, so I haven't learned them all. So I might be missing stuff that you find in your career that's fantastic that I didn't find, or I might have looked at something and said it doesn't meet my needs, but it might meet your needs. This is my name, I'm Kurt. I have a website, and on there I have a blog. And if you wanna see a little bit about me, you can take a look at that. It's kind of weird. It follows all sorts of random topics that, that just follow what I'm feeling like. I'm not one of those people who blogs only about one topic. This is really my just sort of work notes that I feel like putting out in the public. My background, I have a, a PhD and a bachelor's, and they're in geology for my bachelor's, but that's not the ocean. This was a land-based geology degree. Uh, my PhD was in paleomag, so crazy word, and stratigraphy, mapping the continental slopes. It's all great, but I didn't do a whole lot of computers in that stuff. When I went into geology, a computer was used to write a paper with Word, and when I asked to do some processing and how to do it, the professors looked at me like I was crazy. You looked through the microscope, you, did it, you wrote in field notes, um, everybody carried around something like that, except for a little bit bigger if you're a field geologist, and you wrote everything in here, and if anybody else in this room wanted my notes, they had to come to me and ask. So that drove me crazy. That was my beginnings of research tools was these are really great, and it's, a lot of us like paper and pencil. Paper and pencil is really hard to share. You gotta go find a scanner, or you gotta hand it off to someone and hope it comes back. Uh, you gotta use a photocopier. You're gonna find, when I'm teaching, that you're gonna find influences from, I worked at Carnegie Mellon as a computer scientist, 
and I worked at Stanford in the 1990s. So you're going to see a lot of tools that were popular in this time period that are still being used. And in fact, almost every computer in here has stuff that I actually touched way back when. Not very much, little bits here and there, but this is the things I'm going to show you are all things that have typically been around for 10, 20, 30 years, and I expect to be around for another 10, 20, 30 years. I did learn ArcGIS back when it was called ArcInfo in 1994. I learned something that looks very different from what you did, and I can use about 5% of my knowledge on that. It's nothing like ArcGIS is today, and I have no idea how to use ArcGIS today. I've taken classes, I'm not an expert in Arc, so you're going to see that. You know, I did all this stuff, and I don't know how to use Arc at all. You're going to uh, be surprised by that when I worked at the USGS, and some of my software is still running at the USGS doing I'm not sure what. This is all stuff that doesn't have anything to do with that. So I expect tools like that to change in a way that maybe what you did 10 years ago doesn't really help. If you used Word 20 years ago and you now use Microsoft Word today, if I try to use Word 2007 on the PC, I get very confused. I've also spent a lot of time at NASA. So you're going to see a lot of stuff that I do is not necessarily like a lot of marine scientists do. I'm trying to combine the best of all of these worlds where I saw stuff at NASA on spacecraft. How can we use those same techniques in the sea for our data sets? Uh, different data, same ideas in terms of processing. And I just spent a month at Google. And I did a lot of stuff with the uh, Earth and the Oceans teams. So you're going to find that I throw in a lot of extra little stuff from Google Earth, Google Oceans, Google Fusion Tables, um, Google this, Google that. So don't be surprised if you hear that, and you can take it as you will. They actually paid me. Do know that. I took money from them. So that's a bias that I have, and always be aware of you know, what people are doing and where they came from. But enough of that. Let's drop into the topics, and I'm going to show you a whole pile of stuff. And a lot of that is going to be gibberish to you. The idea is not that you understand what it is, but just to start seeing the words, have things that you can Google, and start becoming just familiar with the vocabulary, because there's a lot. It's going to take repetition, and we're going to be working on these things throughout the semester. All right, the first thing that I'm going to bring through the whole course is a little bit surprising, and it's security. Nobody likes to have their computer hacked or get a virus or have trouble. So I'm going to try and emphasize this throughout the course is when is a tool OK to use, when is it not OK to use? We're hitting this all over the place with government and industry. If the software is going to get you hacked and you can't find a way around it, you can't use it. We're going to have to talk about security and making sure your passwords are safe. I'm going to teach you things about how to secure copy, SCP, and to secure login, SSH and a virtual private network, VPN. These are all acronyms, but we'll go through what they are as we get there. For now, I'm not going to go into them too much more. The other one is passwords. I'm going to show you how to safely store a lot of passwords and use a different password on every single thing that you do without going crazy. If you can't do this kind of stuff, if you use that little notebook, if you write your passwords here and you lose it, it, goes, it gets wet, it goes in the fire, whatever happens to it, that sucks. So how do you have something where you can have all your passwords, and if someone gets that file with all your passwords, it isn't a plain text file, and they run off with all of, all of your work. And you know if it's your home computer, they run off with your tax information, and you get very unhappy. Not very exciting, but it makes the world go around being able to do things safely. More exciting is we're actually going to go and use something called Linux, which is an operating system much like Windows, except for it's less focused on the graphical aspect of things. We're all going to run what's called a command line with a tool called Bash, which stands for the Born Again shell. And this is going to be your command line. The idea being that if you have to type something, 
Imagine a document where you try to describe how in Photoshop you tweaked one image. You want to adjust the colors, you want to crop it, uh, maybe you remove the red eye. You do 10 or 15 different things. That's okay, maybe you could take a screenshot of each one. But what if you have 10,000 images that you need to process and you need to do it every hour? When you write things out in a command line, you have step one, step two, step three, step four. You can put those into a file and you have a very clear description of what you've done. If you run those commands, you'll get exactly the same result every time. If you drag and click in Photoshop, you might get the same thing, you might not. We've had trouble trying to reproduce like color balancing, where we have two different people who slightly tweak the slider a little bit differently and suddenly we end up with unrepeatable scientific results. So from that, we have a concept of repeatable research. And you gotta watch out for me on the whiteboard. There's no spell check up here, so I get in trouble. So I apologize for any uh, misspellings. But with repeatable research, the idea is if I go out and do something, I process the data, and then I hand it over to the next person, they should be able to take my data and do exactly what I did without a lot of hassle. And you'll actually find, I'll give you guys a link to it, there's different ratings for, for repeatable research. And the harder it is for someone to repeat it, the lower down the scale of repeatable research it gets. So if I can hand it off to the next person and they can do exactly what I did within you know, 10, 15 minutes, minus the time the computer crunched on the data, that's fabulous. If I could ever live up to that standard, maybe I'll retire, but that's the goal. It's not a perfect thing, but that's where we're trying to head towards. How are we gonna run Linux? Because all of these computers in front of you run Windows. We don't really wanna go fiddle with system settings and stuff like that. So we're gonna use something called a virtual machine or VM. And what that is, is you'll download a file. That file is like a whole little operating system inside of a program. I've got a Mac here and you've got Windows. Don't, have, don't worry about your computers, but we'll see if I can wake up mine here. And I'm gonna show you this window on this Mac is running Linux. So I'm gonna go ahead and type in my password. And that's Linux in a little window running on a Macintosh. I can copy that file to any one of you and you'll be able to do exactly the same thing in that little window. You can install software, you can break it, whatever, it doesn't matter because it's just a file and at the end of the day you can delete it and get the original back from me. So the idea is that we'll be playing inside of this and if it blows up on you, if you screw up some configuration, the delete key, you, know, you hit delete on the virtual machine and get the file again and start over. Right now, a virtual machine might not mean very much to you, but we'll start using them. I think you guys are gonna really like them because you can take them home with you on a USB stick and plug them into a different computer and start working again with the exact same environment without having to shuffle around lots of stuff and install software every time. So the idea is, this is a, a little playpen where we can work inside of that's a lot safer than the normal computer. If you blow up a Windows machine, you're gonna have to go up to the IT guys and hand them over your Windows machine for a couple days as they try and figure out what you did to it or start from scratch. And it might take them a little while. This way, if things go wrong, we don't care, we just delete it and we start over. The next thing is, we need, to, if we're gonna be working with data, you pretty much have to have a programming language under your belt. It doesn't really matter what it is. If you're really good at some other programming language that we don't cover in this course, that's fantastic. Uh, I encourage you to keep with it but we're gonna pick a programming language that's gonna work pretty well for us, I think, and that's called Python. This is a, a way that we can describe commands and processes that we're gonna do. We're not gonna get into it all heavy duty like a computer scientist. We're gonna use it as scientists, so just enough to get the job done, to make graphs, charts, collect data, do what we need to do. We're gonna do it primarily with Python. It's gonna be our toolkit of you know, get in there, grab some data, figure out what it is, and get, get our job done. Why Python? That's a great question. There's lots of languages. Like a classic one that people learn in the beginning is called C. If we learned C, it would be about three months before we could do anything useful to open a file, whatnot. MATLAB is another great tool, it's super powerful. It requires a license. It tends to push you a little bit away from nice coding style, so the code you're gonna read is gonna be a lot harder for a beginner to read. 
this cost is really high. Uh, so I wanted something that people can for sure take with them. Python will be with you for the rest of your life. If the company that builds MATLAB goes out of business, you're out of luck. And there's lots of other ones. You'll find people learn Fortran. I had to learn Fortran. It turned my brain to Swiss cheese and made me grumpy. Python tends to be a nice balance of easy to do, very easy to read, lots of scientific data capabilities, but it's not the only language. There's lots of good ones. Like MATLAB is actually a great tool. You can do a ton of science with it, and you'll find a lot of people in this building use MATLAB. But for us, this is something that will be with you for the rest of your life if you learn it. There's a little bonus. If you use ArcGIS and you want to script something in ArcGIS, Python's the language that they use inside. So it's pretty handy in terms of that. I'd like to build you guys tools in your tool set that would work with ArcGIS very nicely in the end without actually doing ArcGIS in this course. Python is a great tool for being in that middle, making things go. The zero dollar sign is awfully nice. It's not perfect, and you may find yourself having to do other things, and you'll see that we'll use little tiny bits of other languages, and we'll do just enough to get by, and we won't do any more than we need to because we have too many things to cover, but it's a nice language for that. The next thing we're going to do is a little scary to some, but don't be scared by this. It's structured query language, or SQL. This is the language of databases. We are going to do only as much as we need to, to to store some data. This is like the spreadsheet of the, of the uh, data world. But it's a little bit easier to follow than what's going on in an Excel spreadsheet. And I've watched too many people get nailed by the I clicked on what cell and what happened problem in spreadsheets. But this is a great way that you can pass data between all sorts of different tools. All of these tools right here all can read data out of a database. So this is the language of databases. I don't want you to become experts in it. If you do, that's great. But I want you to know just enough that this doesn't scare you at the end, and that if you want to put some data in a database and pass it around, it's a great way to pass data because it knows about what column is called what. And there's a really nice database called SQLite. This database is not very powerful, but it does enough that we need it, and it has this great property of most databases, like if you have Oracle, you have to like, get a database administrator. You've got to pay the person to be here every year. We have to deal with you know, all these complicated things. SQLite is a file. It stores everything in a file, so you don't have to have a server of some sort running some database thingy and be scary. SQLite is something that we'll play with, and when I show it to you the first time, it won't look like much, but it'll just get used in the background. It's inside of Firefox. If you run Firefox in these machines, it's right there. It's, it's hiding behind the scenes and everything. It's actually the most common database in the world. In fact, this has about, oh, I don't know, 100 SQLite databases on it, just being a, a cell phone. So it's, it's actually everywhere. It'll be on the ships. It'll be in your pocket on your phone. And it's just handy to know this. And there's a really great tool, SQLite Manager. And the best part is this is a Firefox plugin in your browser. And you run this, and it makes your database look like a spreadsheet. So it, it'll be like a very simple Excel spreadsheet. But then you can go take that data right over to Python, to other stuff. And you can load it into ArcGIS. You can do all kinds of things with this data. And you can work with it just like a spreadsheet. But you can actually go and see the raw behind the scenes. Whereas if you open up Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, you're going to be looking at some really horrible, confusing stuff. So we'll do just a little bit of databases. We're going to talk about something that's everywhere now, and you're going to have to face this when you go and write your final report and submit your data for archiving. This is extensible markup language. This is a way to take text and to put blocks around various things and say, what does this mean? So if I have a document, I can put a block around some text and say, this is the title. I can put a block around another bunch of text and say, this is the location. Uh, this is the description paragraph. And it's got these tags that you wrap around things, so you mark things up. It's a, it can get really crazy complicated. We're going to stay away from the complicated stuff. But the key thing is, is that if you need to make ISO metadata, Surprised I don't hear like a bunch of groans from the room at this point because 
Metadata is not very exciting to most people. ISO metadata is in XML format, and there's lots of other types of formats that are built on XML. The great thing is that there's really nice tools in Python and lots of other languages to reach in there and to work with this stuff so you don't have to open it up and read it by hand, which you can do, but there's a lot of little angle bracket characters running around everywhere that kind of turn your brain into Swiss cheese. We'll work a little bit with that, and we'll actually take metadata from files and use it. I know most people just create metadata and throw it out there and hope that it does something useful, but we're going to load in a whole lot of metadata and you're going to use that to make some graphs. So if you have something called a bag, a bathy attributed grid, you can go in there, pull out that XML metadata, and then from there you can look inside that metadata and it will tell you the bounding box of that data on the planet Earth. And so somewhere up there is this little box that you want to put on a globe. And the best part is I grabbed one of these from an archive site, opened up the file, grabbed the metadata out, plotted it, and this was from a hydrographic institution, and it plotted in the middle of Canada, right on land. Clearly, this stuff hasn't been treated well, but it's super powerful and can help us go and check. There was something wrong with that bag or the software that created it that put that data that should have been in the Gulf of Mexico up in the Canadian Arctic. Being able to take this stuff, make a quick plot of it, can quickly show you, am I doing everything right throughout my tool chain? Or if someone gives you a disk drive full of three terabytes of data, sort of a typical number for today's USB drives, and it's full of these, say, bag files, where are they? I mean, what if they're, like a lot of survey numbers are just a number, and you have no idea unless you're deeply ingrained in the organization that made that file where it's from. So by being able to read this metadata, and create some visualization out of it really quickly, you can go figure out what kind of data am I facing? Is it the right data that I wanted? And how do I put it together? The other thing is, is that we're gonna do a lot of text-based material. So I'm gonna get you to use a text editor that's unlike everything that you've used before, I'm sure. It's called Emacs. Emacs is, a, is an unusual beast. It has so much functionality that I know maybe a fraction of 1% of what it's capable of. This is a text editor that if you do learn it, will last you your entire lifetime. It can do super powerful stuff, or it can write a letter to your mom. It will play Tetris. It will do all kinds of crazy stuff. But this is something that if you learn this, it's great for editing software. So if you're writing Python code, it's great. If you want to open up one of these XML documents, it will do that nicely. It's something that I started using in 1999, and it's only gotten better, and it's about the same uh, as it was back then in terms of the interface. So anything you learn in this now will be good for another 20 years at least. How do you compare to UltraEdit? UltraEdit is ultra simple. Emacs has gotten easier to use, but it's super powerful. It'll take a while to get into the features. It can do everything UltraEdit can and more. As a part of this, there's a system called org mode for taking notes and keeping track of things that I talked about planning before and following through. Org mode is a way that you can take notes. And unlike Microsoft Word, it's a flat text thing. So if you want to have a title, you just write a star, a space, your title of a section. You could write this with any text editor. So if you were working in Ultra Edit, you could write that and anything with star, or space, and then some text becomes your title of that section in your document. It's called a markup language, kind of like XML, but a lot simpler. And what that does is lets it work with other tools. So if you've got Microsoft Word in a document, it's really hard to take a Word document and start passing it around other, other tools. How does that other tool ask your Word document, go grab all sorts of different stuff, where are all my notes located geographically or time-wise? Word is sort of kind of on its own. It can link to documents and do some stuff like that. But this gives us a way that we can actually put source code in there. So if you have a little bit of Python script that you want to have in your document that says how to do it, you can actually select that code and say run it right from inside that, that document. It will also produce PDFs for you. So if you want a nice PDF of your notes, if you want to have a web page in a language called HTML, it will do that for you. 
if you want the source to be edit, able to edit in sort of a journal style thing, there's something called LaTeX that we'll look at a little bit. And LaTeX is a little complicated, but we can use org mode to output to all these different formats and it will do a lot more. This is sort of a, a really great way to, to handle building notes and imagine being on a ship when something went wrong and you have five or six people working throughout the ship at all times, how do you correlate the notes between everybody say in this row was doing something different on the ship at that time and they all had impact on some problem that happened with the sonar? You know, somebody was working on the GPS and moved the antenna by accident or you know, a wire was cut here and so now the time signature is not getting into the sonar. How do you correlate that? With this, it's almost a database. So you can ask org mode if you had everybody's files linked together, all right, let's go grab the notes from everybody in this row and we'll see what happened. And there was tech Kurt out on the ship who accidentally bonked the GPS and then cut the line to it. So you can start figuring out from all those notes and correlations what happened in your survey and when. And uh, when you're on shore two years later trying to figure out what went wrong, this kind of stuff can be super critical. For example, someone took a core from the ocean, uh, it got dropped on the deck, for example. That means in my PhD thesis, that core no longer works because you've jiggled everything in that core. I can't use it for my thesis. But I found cases where people never wrote that down. They never took notes or it was in paper and it couldn't get linked in. So this is a nice way that uh, it'll work. And if you don't use Emacs and org mode 10 years from now, it's just a text file. I think you can read star title as text most people, and be able to read right through it as if you're just writing regular English. I apologize not knowing how good it is with foreign languages. We'll have to see, for those of you who write in non-Latin non characters, it may get a little challenging, but I think people even do Chinese in Emacs. A couple more tools. We're going to talk about something called BibTeX. This is a language of journal references. When you find some information that you think is important and you're going to be writing about down the road, BibTeX is a place you can put that. You can link it in through tools called uh, Jabref and Zotero. And even if you, want, if you want, you can actually take references that you put into your database and link them right into your Microsoft Word document if you're sticking with Microsoft Word. So when you go and write a paper for another class, you can take those references and just link to them in Word and when you get done the reference section, it will do everything correctly. If you're in uh, geological oceanography, for example, you'll type in Kennet correctly. And then uh, when your paper comes out and you cite Kennet in your paper, it'll write out Kennet with all the right T's and whatnot. And then Jim Gardner will be very happy. Yeah. Why not EndNote? EndNote is a powerful tool, but these tools do just as well as EndNote at most tasks. EndNote's expensive. When we tried to customize it and do things with it, it got very frustrating. We did some amazingly cool customizations and research tools with, by the way, I haven't introduced him. Dave Monahan has been the illustrious runner of this class for many years, and I'm trying to fill his shoes. Dave and I had the class do a project with EndNote, and it was very powerful, and it gets the job done, but it kind of drove us batty. It's simpler. There are certain things that doesn't have as many journal styles and things like that in EndNote, as EndNote does, but Zotero is pretty powerful. A lot of schools have just switched completely over to Zotero. This runs as a Firefox plugin, so if you're on a web page and you want to create a, an entry in your database of journal references, you see a really great paper on multi-beam sonars, you just hit the button at the bottom and it enters into your database. EndNote can do that, but it's kind of this thing that runs around and you have to bolt it on after the fact. The EndNote folks, we tried to get them to collaborate with us and it didn't succeed. We're going to look at version control with text files. So we're going to look at something called Mercurial, otherwise known by the uh, symbol of the element. And this is version control. If you've seen track changes in Microsoft Word, this is like that. But if all of us in this room wanted to write a paper together, this would let us all collaborate at the same time and merge all of our changes together. Whereas with Word, I have yet to find someone who's able to really work on the same document at the same time and have the changes merged together cleanly. This lets people work on very large, any text or binary file you want to, pass them around, 
and manage files of any sort over the long run. If you ever go back and say, you know what, I really don't like what I've done right now, I need to go back to last week, this will still have it. So if you committed in a change to a document and you want to go back to it, you can do that. You can list all the changes. If two people have worked on the same file and you want to compare how they're doing it, you can basically bring this in and say, okay, how, how does Ed's and Bob's versions compare? It's a really powerful tool, and this is what CCOM is starting to use for its revision control software and text. And you can even throw in binary data if you felt like it. It's not super great with binary data, but it can handle it. So this is sort of your archive store of things and how to share files. We're actually going to use a service called Bitbucket, which is kind of a goofy name, where you guys can collaborate when you're working on research tools. You'll each be able to have a Bitbucket account. You can give each other permission or revoke permission. You can submit bugs on each other's work. So if, if somebody's working on a particular script to, say, handle some part of multi-beam data processing, you guys can copy that into your own workspace, change it, and then suggest the changes back. You can do all sorts of stuff like that. It uses this Mercurial system in here, and will walk you through the whole process of being able to manage files, track changes, and share them with your, your colleagues. Uh, it's really amazing what you can do. I actually had someone I've never met fix a bug in my software, suggest it to me, and within about two minutes of the suggestion getting into my email, I said I looked at it. It it showed to me. Said this is what's changing. Do you want to keep this or not? I said yes, and it went in, and a bug in my code went away. Some I don't know where the guy even lives in the world. It's an amazing way to be able to share stuff. You can also do stuff privately. We're going to start with Bitbucket. The nice thing about this Mercurial is that if you want to stop using it, you just stop, and you can then point. You can send your data somewhere else, and you just tell it where I want to push the data to. So it's really flexible. Unfortunately, that flexibility is going to require a little bit more thought in terms of you guys figuring out how it works, but we'll go through that slowly. We're going to talk about more traditional things that you might be used to hearing about. GMT, generic mapping tools. We're going to make some maps with GMT. This is the, the classic gold standard of a beautiful map. Most, It's a really pretty map. It might be a little hard to make sometimes, but it makes a great, great map. There's also another tool called MB System that reads multi-beam data. We'll take a look at that. It actually uses GMT. And we'll do some things like list out where is a multi-beam data file from. And we'll get like a little track plot out of the file. You could do all of your multi-beam data processing in here. This is when I sort of say, you might start looking at Keras or HiPack or Flader mouse, something like that for your multi-beam data processing. I've processed data in here. It's doable, but it's not super efficient. But you can do things like create automatic maps that, that generate every time you have a new data file from your multi-beam, it can automatically build you a map of the area with a, the updated multi-beam merged in there. It's a really powerful tool that's great for doing automatic stuff that happens. We'll also talk about Instead of ArcGIS, I'm going to start you guys off with QGIS. This is a tool that actually scales amazingly. It's really simple. It's called uh, Quantum GIS. It doesn't have every feature on the planet. It doesn't have even a small fraction of what's in ArcGIS. But you can plug in Python. I've seen people do absolutely amazing stuff with this, and it's free. And it comes with Linux, so you'll just get QGIS. You can also install it on Windows. And it's a GIS tool that you can have with you for the rest of your career. It's free, and it's always there. Down the road, you may end up looking at ArcGIS for some of your tasks, just because this, this is open source, and there's not a huge commercial driving force behind it. So it doesn't necessarily get as many features just jammed into it. We're going to look at a tool called GDAL or as you might hear pronounced sometimes at Google, Geospatial Data Abstraction Library. This is the handy dandy Swiss Army knife of converting formats. So if someone gives you a geospatial format X and you want geospatial format Y, this is the tool that you want. It can read a marine chart, an S57, and output a Google Earth file in one line of code. So once you've seen the example, you just copy and paste, and you, someone gives you a chart and says, please visualize what's in this new chart. There you go. Along with that is 
in Earth Sciences, and also for me in Mars Sciences, projections are a royal pain. There are tens of thousands of projections in common usage. It really is painful some days. There is a library called Proj4, and if you want to convert from some projection to some projection, this tool already knows about all the projections and will do it for you really quickly. So we'll do some examples of projecting data. So going you know, to and from, geographic to UTM, it, it's really great for that. It's actually inside of things like Flatermouse. A lot of tools use Proj to do their projections. I'm not sure if, in fact, I can't say all the tools that I know that use it. There are some really great tools out there that have Proj hiding in the background. It's super handy. It was written by the USGS way back when by their projections gurus and has been taken over and improved over the years by uh, an, um, the, the same guy who wrote GDAL. To go back to my little Google bent, in terms of Google, we'll be using Earth as a nice display platform. It's super easy. It isn't always as flexible as we'd like, but if you want to just put up some lines or an image on a globe, it's fantastic. We'll show you how to make a visualization in Google Earth in just a couple minutes. If you get new data, it's a great way to just to see what's around. If we have time near the end of the semester, there's something called fusion tables. And you can take database type stuff, and this is a cloud database where you can, once the data's in here, if somebody wants to share data with you, you can merge each other's data together and create combined maps. It's pretty fancy. If your map has geospatial information, you can just say, please show it to me on a Google map. So if someone asks you, please make a Google map of this data. Well, I don't know how to do that, but I know how to put my data into here and hit the map button. So it's a, a nice handy way of sharing publicly data sets and combining stuff. I put the US Coast Guard incident database, which is when ships have incidents, otherwise known as accidents, in there. So if you want to correlate yeah, ship incidents with some feature on charts, you load up a table of all the charts that you want, and then you could merge it with my fusion table of <coughs> incidents, and you could do some correlation analysis, things like that. To offset this, this is, this is not a free program. It's free as in cheap, but it's not really an open source thing. We're, we count on Google for this one. There's also NASA Whirlwind which reads the same file format as Google Earth. So we can share data in there. So we'll try out NASA Whirlwind. I haven't used that in a few years, so that'll be a good one to dig back into. Really more important than all of that, I think, is one technology that I want you guys to experience. It's usually associated with little kids who hack computers, but it's actually a really great tool. It's called Internet Relay Chat. And imagine a world where if you're using some software, you ran this program, you pick the channel for that software, and you talk to the guy who wrote it right now. That's what this is. It's a tool where actual developers of software hang out, and you can go jump in the conversation and ask the, the person who actually did the work, what did you do, why, can you help me fix something, or what did I do wrong? It's a really wild and crazy place in terms of being able to do support in real time. The other thing you can do is you could set up a version of this on your ship. And you can have a group chat on your ship that doesn't go outside of the ship. So if you felt like, you know, if you're on a really big survey ship and you got you know, 50 or 60 people running around on the ship, some are up on the bridge, some are down below, some are in their estate room, this is a way that you can have a group chat on the ship, set it up yourself, and be able to, to have logs. You can save them to files. You can do some really great stuff. So I'm going to have you guys use that as the chat inside of the classroom. We're going to look at wikis where you actually save notes in a collaborative form. We have a wiki inside of CECOM. So on Thursday, we'll go ahead and look at the, the wiki and start making some changes. Combining the wiki plus IRC, this is a way that you guys can keep collaborating once you leave here. It doesn't matter where in the world you are, as long as you can get some internet, uh, which isn't always easy on a ship. But as long as you've got that, you guys can keep collaborating for the rest of your careers. You know, if you guys start developing your own specialities, you guys can work together in teams no matter where you are. And uh, you might even be able to pull that off across country boundaries. It makes the world a very small place. I'm going to back up because I got my list out of order. 
Along with Google Earth and NASA Whirlwind, there is a key tool that will help you get data into those two, and that is GeoMap app, which is done at Lamont Doherty. If we can pull it off, we're going to have one of the guys from the team from GeoMap app, Andrew Goodwilly, come up here and give you guys a talk and show you how. This has got a global database of some amazing oceanographic and geologic data for the world's oceans. And this is a place, if you want to find some data, this is a great place to start to try and find data. It's got ship tracks from not every cruise, but every cruise that those guys can find and put in there is in there. So if you're trying to work on a particular part of the ocean, this is a great starting point for, for finding and uh, working with data. Multi-beam cores, grab samples, you name it. There's all kinds of stuff in there. And then the last thing is, I'm going to have you guys actually work on data collection. So you're actually going to collect data. And I was hoping today to actually run through a first example, but not quite year, there yet. But we have a, a weather station on the roof that spits out format called NEMA. It might look like goo to you right now. It's a lot of weird characters. But we're actually going to write a little Python script to grab that data in real time, save it to a file, so you're logging the data as you would for a, a, any science project. You can then use Python to pull apart that data, reformat it, and plot it with a tool called matplotlib. And you're actually going to log it over the network. And there's something called TCP and UDP, which you don't need to know right now, but just throw, throw those down and you'll slowly get to know them over the next uh, couple months. And this is actually network protocols. You're going to grab the data right off the sensor over the Seacom network. When I first started using Python, this kind of stuff was really hard for me to do. I had to do it in lots of code. It took me three or four months to write my first one that grabbed data efficiently over the network. With Python, we'll have you doing that in a few minutes, assuming that I can make my notes not have typos in them. So it's actually fairly easy to grab this data, and you'll be able to plot, and I'll show you next time, a graph that I just made of the hurricane that came through here. So we can grab and watch the pressure go up and down. We can watch the temperature and the wind speed and all that. And do all this within Python, and it will only be a few lines of code. So it's actually fairly easy to do all this stuff, and we'll make use of all these tools uh, to kind of give you the idea of how to go through some data, build a report, archive all of your results. So that's the general gist of what we're going to aim for in this course. Don't expect to have to know all the details of anything. We're going to try and keep each thing fairly independent. So if you get stuck up on databases, we'll give you what you need to go the next time so that you can just kind of follow along. But I want you to be comfortable with all of this stuff so that when you go to do your research, you can pull them out of the toolbox and hopefully have your data work more for you unless you're working for it. Because we've all been abused by grumpy computers, and that makes us grumpy. Hoping that you guys will get a lot of this class, and it's more about you than anything else. It's about giving you guys the tools to go attack your classes and your future research with more weapons. That's it for today. Next time we'll get going, we'll, we'll start running the virtual machine, so you guys will actually see Linux in person. We'll play a little bit with the wiki. We'll blast through any computer problems that get in our way. Thanks, guys.